Welcome to our invite. My name is Nima. I'm Aaron. And this is episode two. And today we're here with a very special guest, our second guest, um, Dr. Madeline Camayo, the Vice President and Chief Pharmacy Officer of uh, Baptist Health. Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, I know you have a very busy day, so thank you for taking time <laughs> out of your schedule. I really appreciate that. Anytime. Anything for NSU. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. So um, for the viewers that may not know, um, just you tell them a little bit about yourself and your role. Sure. So I am the chief pharmacy officer for Baptist Health, and my role is basically to oversee all pharmacy practices, whether it's medication safety, business development, um, clinical practices, and uh, pharmacy informatics, the whole gamut. Anything that if pharmacy touches within our corporate structure, I oversee it. Oh, wow. Okay. So woman of many trades. That's, that's it. That's busy, awesome. Busy woman. Yeah, that's, it. <laughs> that's it. So, um, here at Baptist Health, we have something called the Clinical Pharmacy Enterprise. Can mm -hmm. you just explain what that is and how, how the operations work? Sure. So the Clinical Pharmacy Enterprise is really our corporate entity and structure. Okay. Um, it, it, it gives pharmacy a centralized position within the organization, which is very different from others. Um, and it really helps uh, from a corporate, pers uh, I guess, position mm -hmm. to help standardize cost standardized costs, standardized practices, really help improve quality and safety. Yeah. And it's all uh, done from a corporate, uh, kind of like from corporate down. The, what makes the clinical pharmacy enterprise very unique to Baptist, and I say in our structure nationally, is most times pharmacy will report into, there are other chief pharmacy officers, right? Yeah, in the or, you know, yeah. HCA has one, Cleveland Clinic has one. Yeah. Um, now Jackson South, ha I mean, yes. Jackson Health has one. I think what makes different for Baptist is the fact that most pharmacy positions really report into a chief operating officer. So mm -hmm. they're considerate very much operational. And when you're trying to uh, discuss things, clinical initiatives that you may want to uh, pursue. Sometimes uh, the operations person has no clinical knowledge or experience. Yeah. So okay. mm -hmm. it's a lot of education. Sometimes ideas don't always fly. It gets very crazy. Well, the difference is at Baptist, the structure is very different. Okay. I report into the physician clinical enterprise, okay. which oh, wow. is Really, uh, my boss is the uh, president, and uh, um, he's a. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me get back. Um, he's pretty much the president of staff affairs, medical staff affairs, okay. and he oversees the evidence based uh, committee, which is all evidence based medicine. Okay. So he's brilliant. He's a <laughs> clinician, and it is so much easier when you're really trying to talk about the value of clinical pharmacy and what it can bring to the patient, they get it. I'm so sorry. we get to then, I get to sit at the table with all these really smart physicians in the organization um, that how can I help layer pharmacy into their practices? Everybody gets it. And it's like, it's so much easier to get things completed and done. Um, so for me, it is a blessing that I, I love how they really uh, enabled this structure because it really helps pharmacy push things from a clinical perspective, and it's not about just reducing cost. I understand. Yeah. It's awesome. You, you spoke about how you're in the, with the physicians and how you have that collaboration. So a lot of people might think that, you know, maybe the physicians don't pay enough respect to the pharmacists or they don't respect their opinion. Sometimes if you want to override something, Sometimes the pharmacist might, you know, feel some type of way. Oh, I'm not going to override it because I don't want to step on their toes or anything like that. Have you ever experienced something like that? Is that a myth that's out there? I would say probably 10, 15 years ago, I would say, yes, I think that was a struggle pharmacy had. But today with residency programs, with younger physicians also training pharmacists, uh, you know, a perfect example is we actually, I actually moved the residency program under GME with the physicians so okay. that my pharmacists are in with the, you know, uh, graduate medical education department so within physicians. So they will learn side yeah. by side with physicians. So you know, today our practice has evolved. Like when I graduated, you know, 20 years ago, 
it was rare to see a pharmacist on the floor. It was rare to yep. have a pharmacist part of rounds. Of course. But that has all evolved. And I think over time, physicians have really come to value and respect what pharmacy can, can do. Listen, at the end of the day, I think physicians have so much on their plate. They mm -hmm. have a lot of liability. Yep. Yep. They really appreciate anyone who's going to do, you know, help them give better patient care take weight off and, their shoulders, and take of the weight off their shoulder. And, and if they have the right pharmacist, it's all about relationships. I think yeah, if you yeah. have the right pharmacist, <laughs> you know, that um, they will definitely listen to what you have to say. And I have not had that experience here. As a matter of fact, they're wanting me to do more, oh, you good. know, which is great. You have the time? <laughs> I have the time. <laughs> Always have the time. Um, you know, so I think that's a that's that's kind of changed i think in in as as pharmacists continue to evolve oh, oh oh sorry yeah um so you said like you always have the time when i asked you that question so when we interviewed dr kernan from cleveland clinic he mentioned how his boss said the phrase a bias for yes like i have a bias for yes never say no you always say yes mm -hmm. um when do you think did you agree with that statement and when do you think is the right time to maybe say no you know, for me, I will never say no if it is something that is really going to help patient care okay. or improve the patient experience. Um, because at the end of the day, why did I become a pharmacist? Why did I go into healthcare? Was because I wanted to help the patient at the end of, of that, you know, of that intervention, of being able to talk to that patient. So... I'm never going to say no mm -hmm. to anything that I have to do to either push pharmacy to the forefront or make sure that whatever we're developing or processes are going to better patient outcomes in the end. Okay. Yep. That's a Fair enough. Good answer. <laughs> now, if you ask me to take out the trash, I would say <laughs> I think I think we're all in agreement with you there. <laughs> but that's what the interns are for, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so just alluding back to um, the physician-pharmacist relationship. Um, so obviously, t for us to be able to do things to help the physicians, what changes do you think need to be made in the... Um, the state of Florida for pharmacy mm -hmm. to be able to allow us to help the physicians more, maybe collaborative practice, things like things yeah, like that. Yeah, well, definitely, you know, I think pharmacists, uh, um, I think what happens is with the AMA and other physicians, they don't understand what our role really is. Yeah, that is very um, true. And so they think that we're going to take, you know, jobs away from them, which is not what we do. I think physicians are amazing at diagnosing patients. Um, uh, those are the things that they know how the human body works, you know, what, what, uh, uh, symptoms yeah. could be that, that could lead to the different types of disease states. But I think where pharmacy really, you know, can help and really help is with pharmacists know chemistry. Pharmacy yes. knows how chemistry works yep. in the body. So pharmacists can definitely help physician, which they get very little education in their yeah. education, yeah. Uh, how drugs really work, is I think using that pharmacist to really help physicians in medication management and helping improve outcomes, that's what pharmacists really do. And okay. if they were allowed to pharmacists to be providers, to really be in the forefront of medication management and always tie back to the physician, at the end of the day, the physician always has the, the final say, the final say. Yeah, that's you know, it, it, that's, that's it. So, you know, if I was a physician and I could have a pharmacist take care of those things for me, mm -hmm. then I can really continue to see other patients, um, and follow their outcomes, knowing that medication history, their medica you know, their compliance, their adherence, their education mm -hmm. is being taken care of. I can focus on a lot of other things that I don't have. So I think it's, you know, getting, the uh, medical uh, societies to understand yeah. what our what our role truly is. We're not there to to take it, you know, to take. Now, you know, my thing is, why would you then want to have a nurse? Not that I have anything against <laughs> yeah. nurses, but you have ARNPs that are given to be, Correct. Um, yes. uh, you know, help yeah. for a physician, but not a pharmacist. But not a pharmacist. Yeah. So I, I I think we need to change that mentality and. 
we as pharmacists, whether we're students, we're going to be pharmacists, we need to be more involved in our own um, yeah. in our own profession, profession yeah. and push for legal changes. Sitting by the sidelines is not an option. Yes. So whether you give to the PAC, so you know, to, to so that you know we can push for laws or lobby, we need to do more for our profession. We can't sit by and let people do the fight for us. Exactly. Yeah, I think you know pharmacists can do a better job of showing their value. Absolutely. And um, you know, definitely that's where we need to begin. Um, I think there's a stat that there's a certain amount of pharmacists and only about 10% of them are in organizations. So, mm -hmm. and if, you know, people in the medical field see that, well, they're like, well, what's your value? You know, right. so you have to advocate you know, if, for yourself. If, if you look at whether it's state, Congress, or, you know, physician, AMA, they lobby big exactly. for everything they yep. want. Mm -hmm. Of course. We don't. Even why, nursing, they, nursing's out is? there lobbying, you know. I think, you know, I don't know. It's a loaded I, question. <laughs> I, I, I would say pharmacists tend to be introverts. Okay? We can agree with that. So, we, can, we can agree with that. <laughs> you know, I'm not your typical pharmacist that I would say, but you know, most pharmacists tend to be introverts. They're sure. not really, you know, what I consider big social uh, forefront folks. Um, and I think, I think it's just part of who we are True. that sometimes um, uh, we don't fight for ourselves. We're used to not fighting for ourselves. Yeah. And I think we have to start instilling to speak up to fight for our profession because no one else is going to do it for you do you think that starts in the school area, like from the bottom because I, I agree I, I think, think think about think about all the kinds of things that society in at Nova let's okay. look about how many people participate of all the of all the students that are 10 percent yeah because yeah. I'm sure you see the same people Right. Go to events. But do you, do you think that's maybe a curriculum situation? How do you think they can go forward and implement it? Yeah, how into are we going to develop the because leaders? Because people in school are so focused on, you know, studying for the test, passing the test. And especially now, I don't, I'm not sure if you were in, NSU has a new curriculum. And it's so like uh, back to back to back to back. And it's not really giving the students the opportunity to. Um, well, what I would say is this. Your first two years is about hitting the books. Of course. Getting all of it done, right? Yeah. When you go out on rotations and you're starting to do it, I think that's when you really, start, you really start looking about developing yourself outside of just being a student. Okay. You know, that's when you should look at, you know, helping with uh, legislative societies, mm -hmm. floor, you okay. know, FSHP, Correct. you know, ASHP, you know, get involved in those um, organizations that would help to push pharmacy forward. And Correct. if you can't, the way I look at it this way is if you can't, if you want to be the bench warmer, yeah. right, at least give 20 bucks, yeah, true, you know, true. towards, towards uh, 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 an organization to help push legislation true. forward, true, yes. right? Because at the end of the day, when pharmacists become pharmacists, they make a good penny. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's not like... Pharmacists don't make good yeah. money, right? $1,020. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, I remember as a student, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> you know, oh, we know what I you're talking about. dollars oh, wow, you know, that was great. But, you know, when 100%. I became a pharmacist and now I'm, uh, you know, I'm making $40, $50 an hour, that was like a bigger paycheck. And I was like, you know, I think the biggest thing is at the end, if you want to be a bench warmer and you don't want to be involved, then be involved in other ways by Fair giving enough money to organizations that it's your way to give back. It's Correct. a way to give back to your profession, whether you want to be involved. Some people don't, that's great. But yeah. then at least care enough to, to give to the organizations that can help fight for you. Yeah, for sure. I understand. So a lot of people in the community speak very highly of the opportunities that Baptist presents to, to the population, whether it be in people in pharmacy or not in pharmacy, speak on some of those opportunities that you guys give to the people whether it be a job for in pharmacy or if there are other professions, and how you motivate the new and the veteran um, employees? So I think um, pretty much it's about the community, right? I think your reputation speaks a lot. Baptist has an amazing reputation, and it's an organization that really um, uh, ensues quality, safety, 
and um, from that perspective, they're very much committed to the community that they serve. Yeah. So you will see Baptist fundraising for whether it's cancer, yeah. the you know cancer program, or whether it's for you know they're very much involved with the Miami Dolphins, the Miami Heat, and many of them are joint drives for to give back to the community. So when you have an organization like that. Mm-hmm. Who doesn't want to join an organization that cares about its community True. and really drives quality, right? So that's one thing. But the second factor is leaders. If you have good leaders yep. in the organization who provide an innovative, creative, positive environment where you can practice at the top of your level, mm-hmm. why wouldn't you want to come join that kind of an organization? So it's not just about the organization has to be great, but it's who that organization hires that creates those positive work environments for your employees. And people talk. Yeah, so, yes. right? Small world, yes. So, of course. you know, for me, I've always been blessed that I always try to hire top in talent and try to recruit the best. And when you do that, they in turn do the same this is Play true. The role. so yeah. people work for people it's yeah. not always organizations it, it it's great to have the environment of an, a wonderful organization that actually allows you to do your job and do what you need to do but at the end people work for people yeah when you have a bad manager you could <laughs> you have let's yeah. say it can be a great organization but if your boss you don't want to come to work. No, exactly. Is awful, <laughs> sure. you know, or like you ever seen that movie, Horrible Bosses, <laughs> where you plan how you're going to kill your boss every day. <laughs> you know, if you have that kind yeah. of environment, no matter how good the organization is, that's true. You, you're going to leave. Yeah, that's but, very true. You know, at the end of the day, you, you know, people work for people too. It's a big factor. Yeah, for sure. So I guess speaking on that, when you stepped into your role as vice president, chief pharmacy officer, what was the main thing that you wanted to make sure when you were going through and finish that you wanted to accomplish throughout your time? So I would say there were three kind of major goals Okay. that when I took this position that I wanted to do, it's going to take a while to get <laughs> a lot of it in place, take notes? but I would say to push pharmacists to practice at the top of their license, okay. empower them to be the best at what they do, and develop best clinical practices, whether they're on the inpatient or outpatient. That, to me, was my number one goal. Okay. My second goal was to be innovative, think, the, think outside the box That's to the bring of our show. <laughs> pharmacy services to the forefront and enhance the patient experience. So whether we're developing new services or layering new technology to help patients um, with medica- medication education, improving med adherence, um, help lower medication costs to yeah. the patient, I want to do that. Okay. And my last thing would be to enhance medication safety and uh, uh, our safety program within our healthcare system okay. by creating medication safety coordinators. Uh, creating a chief um, a medication safety officer so that medication safety is is about bringing good quality and, and safety in, within our organization. I want Baptist to be the safest place in the country to administer and prepare mm-hmm. medications for our patients. So you spoke about innovation, and that's really what this podcast is about. It's a showcasing health innovation. But... Um, We've, when we speak to every hospital, they're always talking about innovation. So yeah. everyone's, everyone's trying to be the best of the best. Of course. So how do you deal with um, competition when it comes to the other organizations and other hospitals? Because um, do you see it as competition? Do you see it as a learning? Like, oh, they're doing that, let's do it. Or how, how do you look at that when you see someone else? Uh, you know, for me, it's really weird because I've always been a little bit ahead of the game in, in many... <laughs> True. In many... Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, things that I've tried to develop, whether I was at Memorial or now for Baptist. Mm -hmm. But um, I think is always when you're looking for innovation or when you're looking to improve things is, I think as a leader Mm -hmm. is to be open to ideas that the staff may have, because sometimes the staff come up with great things 
And I think the biggest other issue is to see what else other people are doing, because as other people bring better innovation, I mean, I think, I'll give you a perfect example. I would say about 10 years ago, I saw dosage, which which was an IV um, uh, safety uh, software that we would use to make safer IVs okay. or, or bags or whatever. You know, 10 or 11 years ago when it first came to market, <laughs> you know, everybody looked at it yeah. and they were like, well, you know, we could do this faster. We could do, you know, it's about taking that technology and say, hmm, how can I use that to better, is it going to make it safe? Yeah, yeah, it might slow me down in the IV room, but guess what? You know, the amount of error reduction that I can do in the IV yeah. room is tremendous. Okay. So it's being open to, to what technologies are out there. And I'm very big about going to ASHP trade shows, innovation. Yeah. I read a lot on... Um, uh, you know, tech, I'm a techie. Okay. You know, my first degree is not in pharmacy. I was, <laughs> I was a nerd. I was, I uh, actually have a computer science and engineering degree oh, from nice. UCF. So okay. my first degree was all in, about computer science and engineering. So, okay. um, so I why, helped develop software. Yeah. <laughs> I helped do all kinds of things in, in, you know, when I first came out of, of college. Um, I had my own company, started my own computer company. That was all when computers were, you know, all in the new, <laughs> yeah. you know, the Dell. And then but back then was Gateway. I don't know if everyone uh, yeah. Gateway. That I was, was like big. <laughs> but, um, you know, back then, you know, you know, AOL. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, um, so for me, I've always been... Trying to be innovative, it, it, it's it was kind of part of my DNA, okay. you know, mm -hmm. for that perspective. Um, but I'm very techie oriented, so to me, those kinds of new technology, new yeah. software, is, it was a very natural fit for me okay. when I became into pharmacy um, and improving computer systems, trying to get the best technology to the forefront. To me, is is very natural. Okay. Um, so. You know, everybody has good ideas, you yeah, know, and, and it's always good to, there's no shame in copying other people. Yeah, I, mean, I think true. it's great as yeah. long as if it's the best thing for patient care, um, why not? And I think we should share. I think a lot of times for me, I've always been about sharing what we do with other people because the more we do, the better we become. And I think it really, at the end of the day, what we want is the best outcomes for our patients. Exactly. That's true. So first of all, go Knights. I'm actually a UCF graduate. I there got my go. bachelor's in <laughs> biology. So go Knights. Um, so actually, what made you Are switch? Are you following me? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back you to know, that. You we know, were, you weren't supposed to figure that part out <laughs> soon. We'll get back to that. <laughs> but um, so what made you actually switch from computer science to pharmacy? Because yeah. I actually didn't know that about you. So I'm oh, kind of intrigued. <laughs> Well, um, when I came out of, you know, computer science was very, very much, you know, in the forefront. I actually wanted to be a pediatrician. Okay. And I, my first two years were, was pre-med. And I had to take a computer science for, for, the, for my, you know, med school, okay. pre-med school. And um, I really loved it. I thought it was like, wow, this okay. is like really fun. So... At the time, you know, um, physician, there was an overabundance of physicians going into, into yeah. a lot of the schools. Yeah. So a lot of my friends who were two or three years ahead of me weren't getting into med school. Oh, wow. So a lot of them were either having to go out of the country. They would either mm -hmm. go into Grenada, Grenada, they were going to Mexico, yeah. Spain, you know, Dominican Republic. And, and I was like, like oh no, <laughs> I am not leaving to go and study for 10 years, I have to come back, do a foreign board. By the time I did the calculation, I said, oh, I I'll be in school for 12 that years. Math's that not that adds, I can get three degrees math. here. I forget it. So I decided, you know what, I'll switch to computers. And so I ended up going to, you know, ended up moving to, um, switching to UCF at the time okay. and, um, you know, started. And at the time, UCF really only had the first 
really big um, uh, pharmacy, uh, not pharmacy, computer, uh, uh, computer school. Okay. You know that they were before UCF. It was Florida International. I remember that uh, Florida Institute of Technology. And you guys were the Citrus, right? Were you? Were you the nice? I don't know. No, I wasn't at there at the time. Okay. But that, by the time I went to UCF, <laughs> okay. prior to that, they were very much into. Uh, technology okay. and engineering and computer science. So I decided to go there to really, you know, uh, learn more about computer science. Okay. And um, I, lo I enjoyed UCF. When I went to UCF, there was only 15,000 students a year there. It is not so that. So it ain't that anymore. <laughs> it was like very, very small school. Okay. So when I came out, my first job from after I got my computer science degree was to work for uh, a pharmaceutical uh, wholesale company. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so my job was to um, develop software for their accounting, as well as develop picking the drugs for pharmacies, okay. you know, so um, automating the picking process, okay. because okay. it used to be very manual, you had yes. to go to each, you know, so to, cool. how do we automate it? So, and the other thing was develop software so customers back then could do an electronic um, instead of having and doing fax with, you know, what they wanted, yeah, you know, yeah. the numbers. So we would do the Telzon machines where you would able to, over the phone, you could transmit oh, your okay, order okay. to our computer. And so I was working on developing all those kinds of things. Um, over the years, I was then moved to help develop um, uh, pharmacy uh, retail systems okay. for, okay. cause back then, you know, PCs were starting to come out and, you know, it was, uh, the time where we could put computers now in retail pharmacies, okay. retail pharmacies were using <laughs> typewriters. <laughs> we had to file, you know, you had to file Ancient. your prescriptions Ancient. by number. <laughs> the lines must have if been really <laughs> long. Now it's long. Imagine <laughs> then. Well, it was really funny because, you know, I wasn't a pharmacist or anything, but I was like, you know, these poor people, like I remember <laughs> the the people will come, oh, I need my prescription. Did you bring your bottle? No, I can't give you your medication unless you bring oh, your bottle. Wow. <laughs> so, because then they'd have to go back yeah. and find the number and check to see then, oh, and then my. take minus one. Okay, I gave you one, for, minus two. So come unless you had those. <laughs> no wonder no one wanted to be a pharmacist back no, then. No, <laughs> So, um, you know, so I was helping... At the time, uh, I uh, then uh, started to, I moved out of the wholesaler and okay. started my own computer company and then consulted with National Data Corporation oh, wow. at the time to, uh, which is out of Atlanta, to help them uh, install and develop retail pharmacy systems. So I started working there, got with within my own company, uh -huh. installing r retail pharmacy systems. And my, it's really weird because like all my clients was, you know, Sedano's, um, Lowe's Pharmacy, yeah. you know, all these in small independent pharmacies, yeah. which many have grown to be bigger or have been bought out and, you know, by yeah. CVS or Walgreens. But back then there was a lot of independence. Okay. So that's where I started with pharmacy. Then Y2K came. I don't know if you ever know about Y2K. So Y2K was when in 1999, okay. you know, I was six. the, the, the <laughs> computer systems were going to crash around oh, the country okay, because it yeah, could not, the chips could not read 2000 because oh. the chips were used to reading 1990, you know, okay. 19, you know, 1990, 1991. I, I've heard of that. So 99, you know, we had to reprogram chips and everything to so make sure the computer could hit 2000 or else wow. we were going to, you know, everything would freeze. Nothing would work. You couldn't transmit orders. Okay. So the banking industry was coming. So it was the year before 1999. It was a, a massive time of working late hours, reprogramming. And, wow. and I was like... I hate my job. <laughs> That's when you were like, I'm going to change I hate my job. You know, and I said, you know what? <laughs> I've been doing all these things. I could count tablets, you know, <laughs> and get paid the same, <laughs> the, same the same amount I'm getting paid. You know, you think, again, you're yeah. looking from an, you know, yes, I you can don't sit actually here know. and count tablets. That's easy to me. I could do this. So, so bottom line is I, I decided, you know, I'm going to go to pharmacy school. Why not? Okay. I mean, I had pre-med. It's, it's a good way to merge what I now know with everything that I've built in pharmacy, yeah. you know, uh, programming for the pharmacy industry, that why not, you know, go back to my clinical roots and, and go into pharmacy. So that's when I applied to Nova and, and then started at Nova. And um, when I finished uh, pharmacy school, 
Uh, I still ran my computer company uh, while I was going to school, which was a, awesome. a whole other story. Kudos but, to you. Um, uh, then went on to uh, uh, do a residency at okay. Broward General. And at that point, I really fell in love with pharmacy. So I sold my computer company and became uh, started working in pharmacy uh, at Broward General. So that's how wow. I ended up going to pharmacy. And it all, that computer science background has been amazing because yeah. for me, trying to get pharmacy systems and hospital to be more mm -hmm. safe, trying yeah. to uh, automate our processes in pharmacy back then that there wasn't a lot of automation yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So all of that has served me well. And it's great when you have IT background your, and your exactly. IT department doesn't know that. And you come <laughs> to the table and say, nope, we can't do it. I go, Actually, really? Yeah. But you can. Here's how. <laughs> so that, the, after that, it was like the IT department goes, oh, you cannot fool her. She, <laughs> she knows her stuff. So we always got, at, at least when I, while I was there, we always got what we needed in, in IT. That's and it's been, in a, it's been a great ride from there. Do you feel like um, you mentioned how you were, you're not the tip, you don't have the typical pharmacist mindset or whatever. Do you think because you did do the computer science first yes. and then came in that that's why you yeah. don't have and, and like owning that? your own business? You know, I yeah. think for me brought, you know, it gives me a lot of the business leadership leadership that I have today because I always tried to treat my department or pharmacy and perspectives as if it was my business. Yeah, this is my business line. This is. I need, what can I do to make it successful? Because for me, if I did not, if I didn't make my business successful, I couldn't pay myself and I couldn't pay some <laughs> yeah. of my employees, right? Uh -huh. So you always had to hustle. You always had to go out and get new clients. You always had to, you know, try to get new projects so that your team could work on it. And, um, you know, being able to think very business-like and merge that with the clinicals and computers has been a great has been a great foundation for me. And it's really kind of helped me lead where I am today. So you think when you're hiring, um, you know, new pharmacists and things like that, are you looking for the same qualities that you had? Um, are you looking for more innovators? Or, yeah, are you looking for the business mindset, the clinical background? What do, what do you think the main thing, if, if you have somebody sitting right here, what's the main thing like you're Obviously you have to have both. Like, like, clinical, but what do you think <laughs> pops out, stands out to you? I think for me, it's more about... Um, Two things. Okay. Is this person a lifelong learner? Okay. Right? Because if you think about everything, I've had to l learn differently. Yeah. You know, I started one route, came and did another one, then changed my course. And, you know, but I was always willing to learn something new. That's big. Is not being afraid to take a risk and being a lifelong learner and having passion for what you do. Mm -hmm. those are the three things I look for. And I basically ask a lot of questions around that when I'm interviewing a, pro a potential leader. Yeah. Um, those are the things that are important to me because I think when you get that kind of combination, you can have someone who's very good clinically, but yeah. has horrible people skills yeah. who can't think out of the box, who doesn't, you know, they're set in their ways, don't True. want, you know, that's not a good fit for the kind of person that I would want on my team. So it's really being, um, uh, I want to look for somebody who can, you can learn to think out of the box to a certain degree, True. but it's, it's about following your passion. Mm -hmm. If you're really passionate about what you do, you're willing to do anything it takes to get the job done, Very right? True. right? And bias so, for yes, saying yes, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned how you had a business. Now, and I think like computers, they might have like, you know, got hype and then they mellowed down. But I feel like now it's like getting hype again because all the innovations and everything. Would you ever think about opening a, a business again? No. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, if maybe if I was 20, you know, I, 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 it's I never would. never too late. No, no. I think I, I love what I do now. I think I am where I'm supposed to be. Okay. okay. And I think for me is um, I really like, I still get to do the business ends of it and right. not have to have all the risk. I think the big, <laughs> and, and no, True. because let me tell yeah. you, I think that was the biggest thing for me is people think, oh, having your own business, great. But when you have employees under you and you're the face of that business, 
if pressure. you can't, it's me, a lot of pressure. Yeah. And let me tell you, there were nights where, you know, uh, you know, you're a small company and sometimes th- there's one thing I'm not good at. And I will tell you is Uh-oh. this, <laughs> is asking people for my money. <laughs> okay, we're, <laughs> to all pay in, me. we're all in the there. <laughs> you know, to pay me. You know, so it was all, that was kind of like, you know, for me, that was very difficult to be called. Yeah. Listen, you haven't paid me. It's been 30 days. Yeah. It's been 60 days. It's 90 days. It's 120 days. And so it just like, dude, I gave you, I did your job. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> just pay me. <laughs> so, you know, after a while, I'm just not, I'm not. I like doing what I do, but yeah. I hate to chase the money. I'm not the accountant. I, yeah, hate, yeah. I understand. I, hate that I get that. So, you like um, the money, money going to your bank account. I like, like that, <laughs> but not, you know, you know, I, I, it, that was always, that was, that was tough, you know. I understand. And sometimes people didn't mean to, but it's just like they get bogged back then. They didn't have computer systems. Some of them didn't have, uh, you know, automated ARs. You had to write checks by hand. And, you just had to call know, them. If, so I'm like, dude, I'm I can write you an AR program. I can get it for you. <laughs> Please help me help you. <laughs> help you. But no, it was, I think that for me, I knew that, you know, I don't want to do that again. I think no, even sorry. though you still have to, it's a lot of pressure. Now I can really do what I want, but I don't have to bear all the yeah. All the responsibilities, you know, I think I can still be innovative. I can still, you know, convince my colleagues that this is what we want to do. This is what we can do that improve care and not have to, you know, pocket, yeah. you know, that, in, you know, fund that innovation. That's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So you said you, you are basically, you, you know, this is where you're supposed to be. Um, in, in pharmacy. So where do you think pharmacy is headed within the next 20 years? And how does Baptist um, plan on being in the forefront of the changes? Oh, I don't know. 20 years is a long time to predict. <laughs> five or 10? But I can <laughs> give you, I will say in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be a huge evolution of healthcare. Okay. I think digitally, if you think of where we're going, Amazon, how they're trying yeah. to get into healthcare, you know, even into the pharmacy space. Um, I think in the next five to 10 years, pharmacy will be a huge leap in precision medicine. And pharmacy will change how they counsel patient, look at patient. If you think about the types of drugs that'll come, that I think will be available in the future is, I will give you a test. Let me check your DNA. Mm-hmm. Let me see how your how yeah. your genetic contact that. is going to um, metabolize drugs. That's true. So now I can create a drug for you that for you <laughs> for yeah. that Personally, you know will help you with whatever disease state you may have. Yeah. And think about it. You won't have so many side effects. You mm-hmm. won't have adverse drug reactions. Yeah. You because this drug was. You know, Personal, this is the drug that you. really is either for you or there are going to be classes of drugs yeah. that I could say, okay, this is the best class. This is the best drug for you to take for your blood pressure because yeah. your meta- your metallic, yeah, you we know, get what you're saying. Yeah. your cellular, you know, all that DNA genetic, however you metabolize drugs is, is going to be a whole different ball game. And so pharmacists are going to have to become pretty much even more scientific and learning how these drugs will or not work and, you know, what pathways they take to metabolize. If you're deficient in a particular pathway, then you need to give this drug. So it's even going to get even more precise. And I think um, overall patients' health and med adherence will increase because normally most people don't want to take their drugs either because awful side effects. They don't like it exactly. or, you know, I can't afford it. So True. those are pretty much, I think, fixing one big part of that mm-hmm. is going to be pretty fantastic. Um, so if if that does happen and that that's what it comes out to. So, you know, you know, 80, 90 years ago, people were living up to 50 years of age. And now people are living up to 90, 100 years old. Yeah. So if that happens, obviously the lifespan of we're going to be, we're going to live longer. How do you think that's going to impact the hospitals and, you know, the business of the hospitals? Because obviously less people are going to be going into the hospitals and doctors. How is that going to, how are the hospitals have to shift around that to be able to So I think probably, 
I would maybe 10, 20 years from now, I do think um, our goal in healthcare to reduce it is to try to keep people out of the hospital as much as we can, yes. right? By um, living a better lifestyle, by, um, you know, doing the preventative things that help keep us healthy. And um, I think hospitals will eventually become pretty much what I would call IMCUs, more, you know, um, intermediate care. Mm -hmm. uh, the acuity, you, you probably won't go to the hospital uh, unless you are really, really sick. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I think now as you see what hospitals are doing, look yeah. around, you know, before, if you look 10 years ago, there weren't a lot of urgent care centers true. out. Mm -hmm. You That's know, true. there weren't diagnostic centers yeah. out. Yeah. If you There's had to be now. diagnosed, you had to be, you either went to the ED yeah. or you, you know, you made, you had to go to the hospital, you had to be admitted, you know, and, and think of the advancements today, you know, you know, 10 years ago, you could only get a knee replacement in the hospital. Yes. You could only get a hip replacement in the hospital. Well, today you have ambulatory surgical centers where you get knee replacements. Yeah. You're going to get hip replacement true, now. Yeah. You don't have to. So you go in and you go out and you go home and you get better. And yeah. at the end of the day, you know, so hospitals have had to change their their mindset yeah, and business yeah. model because yeah. everything is really going out to ambulatory yeah. services or to home. I think as we get older, I think we're going to need more health care because even though we are healthier, um, there are still going to be patients who are going to need care, mm -hmm. you know, care at home, nursing home care. Yeah. You know, there is a silver tsunami coming. Because yeah. we're not having as many children as we yeah. used to yeah. in yeah. the fifties, right? That's true. That's true. That's true. Our younger people are waiting till they're much older yep. to have children. It is, it is expensive so out there. That whole baby boomer, <laughs> you know, all yeah. that is gone. Yeah. So, you know, we're shifting to where everything is going to be either in an ambulatory setting yes. mm -hmm. and you're only gonna really go to the hospital when you're really, really sick and you need to be taken yeah. care of acutely and everything else surgeries are really evolving to where the types of devices and things and is the surgery techniques they're using today is just amazing you know you used to before 10 years ago you went in for a knee replacement you were in the hospital 20 days yeah. by the time you got your knees then you yeah. had to make sure they worked you were you, know, you True. now you don't you go in and surgery out. center yeah. you're out they want to see you, you know, use that knee. They send you to probably a small rehab for a couple of days, yep. but it's all outpatient. Sure. Yep. And um, in a way, it's better because people don't get as much infection, of you know, things like that. But we're changing health. Health care is changing slowly, but it is changing. Yeah, I think um, the approach is more <coughs> is more patient centered now. Um, <coughs> so, and, so I guess what a, one question I have for you is what is what are you doing to get the pharmacist in front of the patient? I feel like there's a, sometimes there's a gap between, you know, counseling, things like that. So what is Baptist um, doing to get pharmacists in front of patients? And also, how are you harnessing technology to do that? So one of the things we've, I've started to work on is really pushing pharmacists to the forefront, is really getting pharmacists layered into, the typical is to get the pharmacist on the floor in front of, yep. you know, right there next to the nurses, next to the patients, next to the pharmacists, yeah. I mean, to Physician. the physicians. Yeah. And, um, you know, making sure they are, they are responsible for that floor, that area. Yeah. And they are known as the expert or whether it's internal medicine, whether it's critical care, you know, that, that we're working uh, to get that done. The other piece is um, I'm starting to layer pharmacists in the clinics. Okay. As well. So talk about the collaborative practice agreements, creating yeah. those collaborative practice agreements, working with uh, physicians who really want to partner and have that pharmacist in there. Um, we're making it so that, you know, the physicians can help uh, schedule patients so that the pharmacist can see them. So creating those scheduled patients so pharmacists can really sit down and have one-on-one -on -one, yeah. uh, uh, patient time. We've done that specifically in oncology where we've, we have yep. uh, uh, pharmacists um, 
actually following up and taking care of patients on oral oncolytics okay. mm-hmm. um, and helping physicians even help prescribing and adjusting doses for their That's patients. Right. The other thing that we're look that I'm looking to build out now is a really a telemedicine platform, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, where it's more telepharmacy, not telemedicine, but <laughs> telepharmacy where. Um, we can create, and I'll show you the app um, on our, that we have a care on demand app. And if you wanted, if a particular patient from Baptist had questions or issues yeah. about their meds, they can actually phone a pharmacist instead wow. of call a physician, you're going to be able to call a pharmacist. That's so awesome. that's going to be a whole new platform that I'm going to be okay. creating within the next you know, six months. It's a computer okay. science background kicking there you in. Go. And so that's that's where we're we're looking to do that. So whether it's, you know, telepharmacy, whether it's putting pharmacists in with physician practices, mm-hmm. creating ambulatory clinics and um, moving them into, you know, specific uh, specialized areas of training, mm-hmm. that's that's what's gonna happen in the hospital setting. Do you think taking it back to NSU? When you were at NSU or even back when you were at UCF, if we were to go and speak with your teachers or even your fellow classmates and we were to ask them, who is Dr. Cameo? What would they say? That crazy girl. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I No, you know, I don't know. I think... I was always very outgoing, um, and um, I I was always an overachiever. So they would they would probably say she probably did something, you know, okay. in, you know, good or or or. And I was also I was also an athlete, so okay. it you know I, I was always pretty much around campus. People kind of knew who I was, and um, over time, I hope they would say I was kind, I was loyal, and I was a good friend. That was what I would hope people would say. Who is, who is one person that you remember that's your best friend that you still talk? Is there someone that you still talk to to this day that you graduate with? Oh, yeah. There's there's several. <laughs> <laughs> there's several. There, you know, that especially in college from UCF, there's a lot of my UCF uh, friends that... The engineers. A lot of failure athletes that, <laughs> okay. you know, I that I played either ball with or, you know, basketball. You know, we, we now with Facebook, we've been able to, <laughs> yeah. you know, people connect. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. were you the Madeline Kamau? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was me. You know, he goes, wow, I can't believe you're a pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are the, you know, I never expected that one. <laughs> you know, so people thought I was going to be a cop or, you know, law enforcement because I was always really into you know, the, the, you know, those, those cop shows. And, yeah, okay. and what ended up happening is I really hung around a lot of people who ended up being cops, cops. you know, <laughs> like one of my best friends ended up being a DEA, uh, you know, D ended up in the DEA. I yeah. have another one that ended up as an FBI profiler. So I was like, <laughs> all my friends really went into law and I went, I mean, into law enforcement and I ended up going in medical. So, or engineering, it was kind of, it was kind of funny, but, um, most people thought, well, she's going to be a cop. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, um, I, uh, how do you think all of your experiences, not just from school, just how do you think your upbringing and h- how you were raised and the things you learned, how do you instill, do you think you still use those practices in your everyday, like in your position now? I think so. I think I've kind of told you um, education-wise where things led me that I still use today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I was born and raised in Miami. Okay, and same. my awesome. mom, my mom... Uh, you know, was a Cuban immigrant. My parents came from Cuba. Um, I was born in this country, but I remember, you know, struggling. My mom was a single, was a single parent. uh, And I ended up, um, my mom worked two or three jobs. And I think what really instilled the work ethic Mm -hmm. in myself was the fact that watching my mom, you know, work two or three jobs just to make sure we had what we needed, you know, taught me that, you know, if you want to make it, you're going to have to work for it. Yeah, Nothing's going to be handed to you. For sure. yeah. And especially when you come from a minority background, yep. you know, and, and not from privilege, you. Yeah. you know, you have to work twice as hard yep. <laughs> to make sure you get what you needed. So my mom instilled education and work ethic. And basically I knew that if I didn't get a scholarship, I may not end up going to college. Mm. So I, um, that's why I worked 
not only did I get good grades, but as an athlete, I was able to take advantage of being of a scholar athlete to where one paid for my you know, um, uh, tuition and yeah. the other one paid for my living expenses. So I had to work hard. It was no choice, yeah. you know, so that I don't regret any of it. I think yeah. it is, it's made me the person who I am today and really trying to, um, um, you know, you, you work hard for what you, you want. And I think if you do that, then you can be very, there's nothing you can't do if you work hard. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, we talk about that all the time. Yeah. You know, everybody wants things handed to them, but you, you have to work for it. So that's, that's the thing. I think um, no matter what you do or what you want in life, you, you're going to have to work hard for it. That's true. Um, so my, my parents are also immigrants. I came to this country when I was nine years old. So I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about. And my question to you is, you obviously had to hit obstacles at some time throughout your career. How did you deal with those obstacles and what would be your advice to the students, to the, you know, the kids that are immigrants that come to this country, don't know how to speak English. I was one of them. I, mm -hmm. I came zero English, um, you know, get bullied or whatever. How, what advice would you give to those people and how would you say to get to where you're at now? Yeah, I think is you need to um, be bold. Don't be afraid to take a risk and be bold because at the end of the day, you're going to face a lot of challenges anyways. True. And yep. it's how you deal with those challenges. You try to do it in a positive way because you're always going, my, my mom has always say, you know, you get more with honey than vinegar. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> um, how you react to the challenge is important. And if you can try to react to a challenge in a positive way, not take everything so negative. Yeah. There's always a silver lining. I've always found that there's always a silver lining in, in every challenge that comes up. It's just how you're going to do it in, in to make to make you sure you get over that that hump or that barrier yeah. to and it all it does is really make you be a better person. It gives you the experience, oh wow, you know, when I had this, I yep. I remember I did this, so yeah. I can do this. You know, um I don't think there's anything you cannot do if you really want to That's do it, true. if you put your mind to it. Yeah. Um, and think positive, you know, you know, there, there it's, think about it. You know, there's a lot of people that do a lot of mean things, <laughs> awful things, Honestly. because that's what their mind is at to do, yeah. you know? I mean, uh, but I think if you do things in a positive manner and you want to be successful, you want to make an impact. I think, and you know what? We don't give kids credit today. Hmm. I think there's a lot of kids and students, especially millennials and um, the folks today that want to do that want to do right. Yeah. I mean, I I always think that we're almost in the cusp of the 1960s. Remember when the hippies, you know, in the early 60s, when those teenagers were, you know, parents went up, were going crazy. Oh my God, they're smoking pot. They're not going to do anything. <laughs> they're, yeah. But yeah. guess what? Those people ended up being the CEOs, the yeah, CEOs sure. and <laughs> all. So, all these, you're right, you know, I right. look at kids today. Kids today are amazing. I mean, they're, they're sure as hell smarter <laughs> than, than when I was in, in college. I think what they're coming up with that, you know, that they've had to see. Remember, you know, most of the millennials grew up in a recession, you know, when true. the market went down. So they saw their parents struggle too. Yeah. yeah. And um, at the end of the day, I think we don't give kids credit. I think there's so many things today that they have to deal with. It's not just career, it's student debt. It's, you know, how they can barely afford to buy a house, you know, by the time they get out of college. I mean, yeah. uh, when, you know, when I went to school, I, I think I paid I think it was five thousand a year. Wow. You know, at UCF five six thousand a year. That was the whole year. That was the whole year. That's not you like know? one class. That's, that was not, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So to to now when I hear you know they're paying thirty you know yeah, thirty thousand yeah. dollars a Dr. year. I mean I was like oh my god how do these kids you know and they come out with all this debt yeah. it's 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 difficult. Yeah, it I is. feel I feel for those kids because the advantages that we had are not what That's you all true. have. And I think, you know, I remember when my mom, finally, we finally bought our first house, and I'll, I'll never forget, it was, you know, early, I think it was like 70, 
74. Okay. It was 1974 when my mom bought her first house. It was $60,000. Wow. That wow. was that was how much a house cost. And it was a three bedroom house on a lake in Hialeah. <laughs> okay. You know, it was sixty thousand dollars. Right the taxes 000. were the taxes were probably I think were, I, I remember I, like I remember as a kid looking at the you know, it was probably the taxes were a th- was a thousand dollars was the tax. <laughs> You know, well, and today a, a car <laughs> yeah. is sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> exactly. You know, who can afford a car? I it's mean, I, I, I mean, so to me, is the the challenges that you all face yeah. mm-hmm. is is very difficult, and um, you know, I I feel for the younger generation because they have high student debt. Yeah. They can barely afford to buy a house. Who can afford to buy a car? I mean, pay off your debt. It, it, <laughs> That's not a thing. <laughs> it's 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 all, it's very difficult, and you know, I think those are huge challenges. Besides, then trying to start a career. Yeah. You know. True. Um, so I think you all are going to be much better people when you get to be in your, you know, me, in your yeah. profession and men like because I think you will have different types of challenges than everybody else. And and the other thing that we're facing today is you know, climate change, our yeah. world, well, you know, we're destroying our world little by little. Those, yeah. believe it or not, people think about those things too. No, There's a lot sure. of stresses. Yeah. Yeah. I feel for the younger generation. Do you think the world is flat or round? Okay. Well, <laughs> or, or, you know, oh, the, the oh, new theory where uh, they, everybody thinks it's flat. Now. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen it from, I, I've seen <laughs> pictures from the, from space. It looks round to me. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> So, um, so I guess what what do you say to um a lot of students? Who, of course, you just mentioned we're facing a lot of challenges. So, also there's a stigma that the pharmaceutical market is saturated. So, what are you saying to students that are already facing these um you know decisions about yeah. challenges uh, financially? What do you say to the students that are actually going into the pharmacy market? Well, what do you say to them that are like, oh, it's saturated. I shouldn't have it. I, I shouldn't go into that market. So I would say, listen. Um, there's so many things. If you want to do the, t- the traditional yeah. pharmacist role of being a retail pharmacist or a hospital pharmacist, I would say, hmm. Yeah. Okay. I understand what you're saying. But listen. There's so many other opportunities. There's so I'm many other opportunities that a pharmacy degree will give you that you will not you will always have a job. Yeah, it just doesn't, it, it, you just have to think outside the box and look for other things that pharmacy can fulfill. You can be a researcher. Podcast. You can be <laughs> a podcast and talk about pharmacy. You can be a writer. You can be yeah. a writer for a medical journal yeah. on oh, pharmacy, true. on drug things. There, you can be a medical liaison for a pharmaceutical company. Yeah. You can do clinical pharmacy practices. You can. The, there's so many other things that yeah. people that you can do with your pharmacy degree. Yeah. That. At the end of the day, why are you going into pharmacy? It, you know, if I, if it's just about, I want to be a pharmacist behind a counter giving, you know, giving drugs, yeah. we're not there anymore. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We're more than that. Why not start your own clinical, you know, I, I would, you know, me, I would start my own clinical MTM clinical program, yes. have, have, uh, physicians, you know, refer their patients to me, yeah. um, start you know, ACO. start doing, yeah, doing all kind. do your own ACO, <laughs> do all that kinds of stuff. There's no reason why today yeah. that don't let anybody tell you, you can't, you will never get a job because you will get a job. What in whatever you want to do, you just have to make sure you're you're passionate about it. Yeah, it's like what you said. And if you know what? It, at the end of the day, there's yeah. a lot of older pharmacists that are going to retire too. So yeah. who's going to take no, those true. jobs? Yeah, so I mean, I can tell you in the in our organization, there's a lot of pharmacists who are going to retire in the next, yeah. you know, two to three years. Hey, that's when we come in. That's it. <laughs> right when we graduate. So <laughs> I get what you're I'm saying. I'm just though. saying. So you don't know, limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Yeah. And you know what? Okay, maybe the Florida market may be. Uh, you yeah. know, I'm just, and I don't think so, but yeah. the pharma market might be, there are many other places that of need course. pharmacists that can't get them. That's true. 
There's sure. rural areas, there's public service, there's there's so many, the military, there's so many things yeah. that people can, can get pharmacy into. I think um, when I work in a retail setting, and I feel like whenever I go into different stores, I tend to see the same thing with from the pharmacist. They're always, they're like, oh, I want to start a business on the side or something because yeah. they're not, wh whatever it might be. So my th t question to you is... Isn't that called the side hustle? Exactly, there, exactly. So we know there's, about that. Plenty, there's a lot of people who can do side hustles. Yeah. I mean, if you're innovative, there's why not, you know, create a pharmacy app? There's, there's yeah. so many things that you can yeah, do today true. and that, you know what? as uh, most people today love the side hustle because yeah, I can yeah. still pursue, yeah. but you know what? I can, yeah, I can get very creative into doing something else. Co yeah. Coming from a person that owned a business and a different uh, computer science background, do you think you need a business degree to start a, to start a business? Do you think it's important to get the MBA? Oh, no, nah, I don't know. I think today with the internet and everything else, you can look when I had to apply for a, a I remember my 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 business uh, yep. license mm -hmm. or you know uh, my business charter and yeah. all of that. I had to go to the lawyer. I had to get all these paperwork filled oh, no. out. We don't I had to get that all of that. Yeah, we'll, you know, with all, all that, that now, <laughs> now you can you can you can pretty much have a home side hustle on your yeah. on your yeah, phone. That's true. You know, create your app, create yeah. a blog, create whatever you need to do, and do it all on the phone. Yeah, yeah. and you can still work, but you know. Uh, excuse me, I have to get my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm yeah. I get you. you know, I gotta, I gotta get this business hour. call. <laughs> I gotta take this business. Call. I get but you. yeah, I'm just. There's no reason. Yeah. I mean, and it, it, I think I think kids today are are amazing and creative. I, I love the I love those people who have the side hustle. Side hustle. Yeah, this is, this is our <laughs> this side is hustle. Our side, side hustle. hustle. There you go. Um. So back in 2015, you participated in a mini series titled Women in Leadership Speaker Series mm -hmm. that um, was put on by the SCCP, the student chapter at NSU. You, did, you, did you dream, did you look that up? No, no, <laughs> I, I, I knew this. I was there. I was there oh, when you, you were did there? this. We I was there. Well, I don't think 2015. We were, no, we weren't in school yet. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in that uh, mini series, you spoke about the importance of thinking like a man, but always acting like a lady when taking on a leadership roles in an attempt to be successful. Can you speak on that? Sure. So if you look at how men and women think differently, yes. right? Okay. There's no argument there. <laughs> Um, and I think in our society, what I really wanted to do is empower women to be bold. Yes to be outspoken, to have confidence, to, you know, when a guy walks into a room and you got four guys in the room like, hey, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, women come in, they're very, you know, yeah, very meek. And even in meetings, women sometimes don't get heard mm -hmm. because they don't want to speak up. They don't want to yeah. look stupid. They don't, you know. Yeah. So the way we go about doing things is women tend to be more naturing, more yeah. nurturing, you know, we do things a little bit different. So my point is when you're in business and you want to lead and you want, yeah. you can't be no. the meek, you can still act like a lady, yeah. but you have to think like a man yeah. and you have to be bold and you have to push your way through and you have to sometimes, you know, the problem is when women have egos, then they're called very negative. Yes. When men have egos, man, they're, they're, they're the bomb. Yeah. They're like, you know, yeah. so it's like, for me, it's always been, I, when I go to the, I want to be one of the guys. Yeah. I don't want to be known as one of the girls. I hear you. Because then men tend to see you differently. Sure. But I, I'm, you know, I, I still want to behave like proper, of course, you know, of course. Like, you know in, yeah. in that manner. So that whole speech about getting them to have confidence in themselves, you know, that most times when when you're in you're the only woman in the room yeah. sometimes the guy squeeze you out that's true yeah that's true so you have to be able to learn how to posture yourself so you i'm one you're of you in it yeah you know so that's that was what that was all about and i think okay. that's that's worked well for me yeah. we'd, we'd say you know. so <laughs> <laughs> so i guess taking that how, how big is it for teamwork and part of you know the organization you run how, how big is teamwork for you and uh, how much you try to instill um the teamwork um vibe if you will into what you're doing <coughs> teamwork is everything yeah. you know i can't be everywhere at every and everything of course so 
I think the biggest thing is <clears throat> being a good leader is setting a vision, okay. letting people, I don't have to tell you how to do things. Everybody has a different style. Yeah. Everybody has it. My point is if I say, I need you to move this paper to this side of the room, mm -hmm. you know, within two days and you can't touch the paper, you know, I, I give yeah. you, I just tell you, this is kind of what you need to do. Yeah. I'm not going to come to you and say, okay, no, you're not doing that right. No, oh, wait a minute. Have you I done, you. you know, so you. you have to have confidence in your people to let them do That's true. the job. Yeah. If you set, if you set expectations, you set things yep. Yep. and it's all about teamwork because at the end of the day, I can't do everything. Yeah. For sure. So it's the, the importance of teamwork is if you push everyone to understand your vision, what you really want to accomplish, and everybody puts an effort to be successful on the different pieces at the end, you pretty, you pretty much have an amazing um, success because everybody's working towards the same goal and maybe in a different way. It doesn't matter. It doesn't That's all true. have to be done the yeah. same way. But in the end, everyone contributed, everyone did it, and it's, it, it becomes very, very uh, prideful. Yeah. And I think for me, being an athlete, Mm -hmm. and always participating yes. in team sports, you know, you could be the best home run hitter, yeah. you know, on the team, you could, you know, um, but if you, you know, missed a fly ball and you let somebody else, you know, uh, you win together or you lose together, That's true. That is you know, <laughs> there is yeah. not one, unless you're playing uh, a solo sport. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we you, all go to championship you, break at that. You, you <laughs> all have to yeah. play well together. Everybody has to fire so that your team wins. Yeah. And it's not any different in work, and it's not any different. I consider everybody part of my team. And so if I need to motivate you, just like a coach does, yeah. to help you, you know, do a good play or, you know, move you over the gold line, then we have those conversations. But... At the end of the day, to be successful, it takes a village. Yeah. You know, healthcare takes a village. You know, think about it. When you're sick, you yeah. see the physician, you see yeah. the nurse, you see the pharmacist, yeah. you see, yeah. you know, you see all kinds of people. And if they don't have teamwork and getting you better, yeah. Yeah. it's not good. So I'm sorry to cut you off, no, but how do you get everybody to buy in to your vision? <clears throat> I think being clear. Okay. You set clear expectations. If you don't set clear expectation up front, true, it's people don't know what you want them to do. That's true. And I think at the end of the day, it's not, you know, I go back to sports and analogy because I think people really get it. You know, Nick Saban isn't a winning coach because he just goes out there and says, rah, rah, rah. Rick, Nick Saban's a winning coach because he sits there and really, you know, looks at every film, knows every, you know, yeah. you know, type of uh, opportunities against other teams. He prepares then, he turns around and prepares his team and coaches and, and everybody has to do a, a specific thing. For me, it's no different. Yeah. You know, I, ha I want to accomplish a telepharmacy platform. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know I need to work with IT to get the right platform, get those people to understand what we're trying to do for telepharmacy. I, and then I need to get the right pharmacist who is not, who's not um, shy to be able to talk and has good clinical skills to talk to patients. You know, so it takes to get this all together, yeah. you, you bring the right people uh, to yeah. at different times in whatever project you're working. And as people come in and out, it's not any different than coming in and out of a game True. that True. you end up, you know, yeah, you know, successfully completing a project or successfully moving, you know, what you the ball, you yeah. know, to the next to the next level or to the next go down or whatever. So, really, life is not any different. Yeah, believe it or not, yeah. or yeah. work. <laughs> At the end of the day, so it used teamwork obviously is so important, but. Life's not perfect, right? So it, there's no, uh, there's going to be issues in a team at some point, or no, no team is going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the complications? Like before we came here, you you were having a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, there's a b bunch of people at the table, and you always tend to hire the innovative people, people that have you know things to say, and they want to step up. Maybe someone says something that someone doesn't agree with. When do you think is the right time to step in? And you know, 
step in the between of someone or, you know, how do you go dealing with complications between the team? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think when you hire people who are mindful and who can treat other people, listen, we're never all going to agree on everything. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's a fact. Okay. That's a fact. So, but we can respectfully disagree to agree <laughs> to disagree. Yeah, exactly. We can yeah. respectfully yep. agree to disagree. Yep, yep. I think um, it's healthy. It's important. It is. You it know is. what? At the end of the day, I don't think I've ever had to step in where it's been v very, and I think over time, you know, you, you learn patience and you learn, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yep. I mean, if you talked to me 15 years ago, I probably would have been over the table. And, <laughs> that was when I asked you, know? you what would they say about you? That, 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 she left that out. That's, she right. Left, she left that That's what out. I said. And they thought I would have been a cop. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you meant. Okay. I, you know? <laughs> we see what you're saying. <laughs> but, you know, and, and you know, that's, that's exaggerating. But, you know, I think with time, you learn finesse. You learn yeah. how to, you know, you, uh, a lot of good people come in your life that help coach you. It's, it's not anything that help coach you how to be a better player. Yeah. You yeah. know, how many players go out there and, you know, they don't good at some things, but you get the right coach, you get the yeah. right thing. People end up, you become a really good player, you know, over time. So it's the same thing with the team. I think I am lucky enough to say that the majority of the people that are with me have been with me almost 20 yeah. years. Wow. So they, a lot about they, you. they yeah. followed me from from one yeah. healthcare yeah. to another, wow. and, built a and then yeah. <laughs> left that and came to you know yeah. you know to Baptist. So if you think about the people, I don't think there's anybody that I brought with me who was part of this team mm -hmm. that haven't been with me for a very wow. long time. You built the dream that team. That says a lot about you. <laughs> you built the dream true. team. I, I'm, yeah. I'm very blessed yeah. because I think the people that have wanted to continue doing that, um, you know, to continue moving and, and bringing up another system yeah. is, is a, is a blessing. And I think I'm very blessed to have people who, who want to come and work here. Yeah. But I think it's the culture. So if you set the culture, they know. They kind of, they, it's really weird because they go, oh, we know what Madeline's going to say. Oh, no, we know. <laughs> you know, we know Madeline will say this. So yeah. they know. They know we you. all kind yeah. of know. Each we other. know each other. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, we all, some of us may have our disagreements, but we, we yeah. work through it. Yeah. You know, it's like a marriage. <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. You, your wife, your girlfriend, your, yeah. you know, at, at the end of the day, you may not agree with your girlfriend. You know, I don't want to go to that movie. No, yeah. this is a great movie. Want I want to see pizza, action. You, want burger. I want, you know, at the end of the <laughs> day, <laughs> <laughs> we all compromise, right? As long as we yeah, both sure. eat, you know, it doesn't matter if we have a pizza or a burger. As <laughs> long as we both eat. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> That's it. You learn that one. <laughs> Very early. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. the team is no different. I mean, we yeah. have work relationships and we work together for long hours. Yeah. We're here, you know, from eight o'clock to five o'clock, Monday through Friday. We're yeah. here more than we are with our families. True. So we end up being a family and it's not any different than, you know, I'm kind of like mama bear, you know, and they're the cubs and they all fight <laughs> and we, you know, not that they all fight, but you know, there <laughs> is disagreements and things like that, but we all work it out. At the end of the day, we all work. We're yeah. all professionals. Exactly. And that's the most important thing is to be professional. That's why I say you have to be, you can get your point across, you know, very professionally and, and, yeah. and, and have, and have discussions. And, and at the end of the day, one person decides we're doing it this way or that yeah. way. Yeah. I always say there's a difference between arguments and discussion. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's two, it's two different things. Exactly. Correct. Being professional can't be stressed enough. I feel no. like, I feel like sometimes as millennials, we actually don't get enough credit for being professional. Um, but I, I think it may come from the parenting styles a little bit different now, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't think you can ever be too nice or too professional. So no, I agree. Yeah. I think you, 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 you got to work that. It, yeah. You got to do that. It's important. True. True. So going back to you thinking I was stalking you, but I wasn't. <laughs> He's a uh, don't trust this guy. And He's an article on drugtopics.com. <laughs> hey, that's the, that's the last question. That's the okay, close. Okay. That's the closing. Okay. Um, an article on drug top, drugtopics.com, you mentioned, and I quote, staff education and engagement is critical. When you have a well-educated team across all clinical areas, it will be a natural turn in mindset from a fee for service to value-based care. How do you go about making sure that every person you hire implements this right here? 
um, is by, you know, I really, again, hiring good leaders so that they can in turn hire well underneath them yeah. um, is what really makes a difference. And being able to create, I think the key to being success, successful is that you need to be a good communicator. Yeah. You need to be able to make sure everyone understands what your expectation is. Yeah. Um, when you're educating, whether you're educating your staff, whether you're educating your patient, where they, you know, at the end of the day, if you have good communications, and I try to hire people who know how to communicate well, because that's, that's a huge piece to being a leader. For sure. Yeah. Okay. I think it's about being respectful. Yep. It's about um, actually embracing those differences that only exactly. makes us better. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think from from that perspective, when you, to me, it's it's about again educating that staff, pushing them to do what's right. And in the end, when I was talking about that article, is that we're used to getting paid on a fee for service. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, but if you don't have a structure to push the staff to think value base, yeah. Yeah. we're never going to get to that, to that level. To that yeah, level. Exactly. So, you know, in turn, I think, you know, being able to be a good communicator and educating folks is a great asset to have for sure um so you mentioned success define success oh my god you didn't google this i this Come one on, man i did but uh, i, I no. don't i don't want to say your answer already, i did find <laughs> you did, did you talking. google me on that <laughs> no um i success i think you know success is um if you reach your goal and you're happy with who you are, you're successful. That's true. I don't think you need, success doesn't mean to me that I got a, you know, $120,000 Porsche in my driveway. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got the mansion on Brickell. Yeah. Um, I think is, you know, I, I see people, what do you define success is, did you, are you, is your heart happy at the end of the day? Yeah. If true. your heart is happy at the end of the day and you're happy with who you are and you're happy with what you're doing, then you're successful. Because how many parents, I mean, I look at, you know, parents who raise, who's raised great kids, yeah. they're successful. I think they did a, a wonderful job in mm -hmm. what they do. Um, so to me, success is, are you happy? Are you happy with what you do? Are you passionate about what you do? True. And at the end of the day, that's what success means to me. Do you think society puts pressure on students and kids nowadays to on that word of success? Like, I think society kind of tries to portray and show yeah. and kind of define success for the generation and not really having, you know, the kids try to figure that out. It's themselves. like you didn't do this, so you're not successful. You know, I think today you know, we put a lot of pressure on students and kids to, to be successful, to push harder, to, to do all these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, you need to define, you yourself as an individual yes. need to define what does success to mean you. to you. Yep. Somebody telling you if, you know, if I were to tell my kid, you're nothing and you're never going to be nothing yeah. unless you're this, then it's not fair. Yeah, that, it's, those, not, it's not fair to 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 putting that type of pressure. Uh, not not pressure, but definition of success. Exactly. I think at the end of the day, success means thing means different things to different people. Correct. True. So you need to learn to define what is going. What do you feel success means to you? Mm -hmm. You know, did I have a successful? career? Did I have yeah. a successful, you know, uh, 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 you know, family life was, yeah. uh, you know, I think for me, if I'm successful at the end of the day is that I've made an impact on a lot of people that in the end helped improve or made an impact to patient care. 
Yeah. So if I can inspire a pharmacist to do something else or and uh, become a different type of clinician or, uh, you know, inspire them to go into a, a different field, yeah. then I feel I'm successful. Like computer science? <laughs> but I could do that, you know, so, you know, success has to be defined by the individual. Don't let anybody tell you what success is. That's true. true. That's true. Is there any last message you want to leave with the viewers? Anything um, you want to I think about they're pharmacy tired. in your life? I think they're going to be tired of hearing about me. <laughs> definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> I think we talked about a lot of great things. On you, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I think, um, you know, follow your heart. And you'll never go wrong. That's all I can say is um, don't let people tell you what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. Yeah. At the end of the day, you have to follow your heart and, and know what's right for you. We're going to name this episode Follow Your Heart. Follow That's Your what Heart. It's be. That's what it should be. <laughs> follow your heart and your passion. Right. If Perfect. you do that, you're awesome. successful. There you it's go. True. There you go. Well, awesome. we appreciate you for taking the time. We know you're yeah. very, very busy. Um, but I'm never busy enough for you guys well we appreciate, we appreciate it, it but, honestly um we know it, it meant it meant a lot for you to take yeah. the time to sit with us for an hour and a little over an hour now but, <laughs> it's been um, fun it, no, it was fun i really, yeah, it was, really it do was. appreciate it so thank we appreciate that you enjoyed it and um thank you to everyone that tuned in and uh my name is nima i'm aaron and well, thank you for accepting our invite